In our last video, we looked at this building here, which was the first building that was built specifically for the telephone company. And as we look down the street further south on 7th Street, there's not much to see here today. Uh, the Red Cross building is down there at the left. So, and of course, there's parking lots. But if you look down the street on the right, you'll see a steeple. And that steeple belongs to St. John's United Church of Christ. And that's the first building that we want to look at. The information I've been able to obtain about this church uh, mainly came from two uh, books. One was the story of Port Huron by Helen Enlick, and the other one was Port Huron Celebrating Our Past, which covers 1857 to 2007. I'm going to combine uh, some of this to give you a better idea of of the history and how this church started. The story of this church starts all the way back into the 1800s, about 1860 to be exact. During that time period, there were quite a few German immigrants uh, in Port Huron. St. John's United Church was actually started as a school for German students. And this photograph that you're looking at now, uh, taken around 1898, shows the students in the German English school gathered for a photograph with their teacher, Mr. Beckenforfer, seated at the piano and their pastor, the Reverend C.C. Haig, standing alongside the piano. Prior to 1860, there were two German congregations in Port Huron. First was served by pastors from Newport, which is now Marine City, and they met in homes. The second met in a building on Butler Street Today we know it as Grand River, which was formerly used by the Congregational Church until they built their new church. By 1869, they had grown enough to need a new church building of their own. They decided on the southwest corner of 7th and Pine Street. This illustrated map was made only two years before uh, the church started to build on that corner, and you can see the uh, southwest uh, corner is actually completely empty there of any dwellings. A church that was 60 feet by 30 feet and high enough to build a balcony was erected at a cost of $5,000. It was dedicated on July 24, 1870. The membership purchased lots to the south where they built a parsonage and behind it a school. In this uh, illustrated map of 1894, you can see that the church is now sitting on that corner. Because it was a growing church, it was decided to enlarge the church in 1891. The old stoves gave place to a heating plant, a church bell was purchased, and a pipe organ was installed. Reverend Haig, who we saw in a previous photograph, uh, came in 1895, and he was her pastor for 24 years. The Young People's Society at that time numbered 124 and Reverend Haig was convinced they needed a suitable place to meet. The little schoolhouse was replaced by a large two-story structure. The first floor served as a school, while the second floor was used for their many organizations. In 1901, the parochial school was closed. And German lessons took place only on Saturday. As 7th Street had become a nice residential street with many fine homes, they felt that their old frame church looked rather out of place. So in 1904, an extensive improvement program was undertaken. The same frame church still stands in the same location, but is now of pressed brick with cream-colored trim, a very beautiful building. The same steeple was used on the remodeled church and since 1959 has been lighted, the first church in Port Huron, to have a lighted steeple. St. John's was deeply affected when the world went to war with Germany during World War I. Many German families anglicized their names and worship services were said in English on the first day of the month. Sunday school and confirmation classes also were taught in English. People targeted their anger with Germany at the church by painting yellow German crosses on the doors and defiling the property. Despite the abuse, the pastor and the church had suffered. 
The congregation in 1918 opened the hall as an emergency hospital to aid those who fell ill during the great flu pandemic. Church services were canceled for five weeks during this period. It also marked the introduction of individual communion cups. The 1918 flu pandemic, also known as the Spanish flu, had infected almost a half a billion people around the globe, and by most estimates killed somewhere between 50 and 100 million people, at that time almost 5% of the world's population. In America, according to the United States National Archives, in one year, the average life expectancy in the United States dropped by 12 years. All told, more than 675,000 men, women, and children in the U.S. died of the virus. Everyone had to wear masks during those times. And they were very serious about it, at least according to this news article. A scores of passerbys scurried for cover, H.T. Miller, a deputy health officer, shot and severely wounded. James Weiser, a horseshoer, in front of a downtown drugstore early today, following Weiser's refusal to don an influenza mask. According to the police, Miller shot in the air when Weiser first refused his request. Weiser closed in on him and in the succeeding affray was shot in the arm and the leg. Weiser was taken to the Central Emergency Hospital where he was placed under arrest for failure to comply with Miller's order. I guess they didn't fool around in those days. St. John's was founded by German people and the services were all in German for many years. But gradually more and more wanted the services in English. Fewer and fewer were left to attend the German services. Now, of course, for many years, all the services have been in English. All right, let's move a little further down uh, 7th Street, going south uh, toward Wall Street. And here we come to the corner of Wall and 7th. This would be the uh, southwest corner. And today it looks like this. There's not much on that corner today, but if we look very close, we see that there is something on this corner. As we zoom in here, we see that there's a bell and it's a church bell, and it belonged to a church that used to be on this corner, the first congregational church. Google doesn't give us a very good picture of this bell, but here's a better picture of a couple of young ladies standing beside it. Although today the bell sits on the ground, at one time the bell sat in the belfry of this church that once sat on the corner, the first congregational church. In 1838, a group of people met to form the first Sunday school. The first church building was erected the same year on the north side of Broad Street, where McMorrin Street would be today, and about where the old jail used to be located. This would be where Superior Street and McMorrin would come together. Looking down from the satellite view on Google uh, Maps, you can see where the church would be. The earliest members, five of whom were Presbyterian, began meeting in 1838. They built the first church in the city on the site that we've been looking at. Although it included people of several denominations, it was a disagreement with the Presbyterian people that led to its final organization. On June 1, 1842, members voted to be independent and changed its name to First Congregational Church of Port Huron. By 1843, it had 43 members, including 18 baptized children. In 1844, the whole church building was moved to another location in Port Huron. This is William Jing's account of it in his book, The History of St. Clair County. In 1844, Major Thorne offered a site for a congregational church, provided the society should locate it on the corner of Fort and Butler Street. The proposition was accepted and the building moved to the southwest corner of the streets named. The church was lengthened, a belfry erected in 1844, and the first church bell introduced into Port Huron placed therein. This was the house of worship until December 25, 1859, when the congregation took possession of the brick church building. 
This would be the church on the corner of 7th and a wall. The German English School Association purchased it and used it until 1870. Subsequently, it was used for business purposes until burned in 1878. Of course, the German English School Association would later become the uh, St. John's United Church of Christ, as we looked at earlier in the video. So what did they use for music back then? Uh, again, according to Mr. Jenks, the instrumental accompaniment was a boxwood flute. Subsequently, an accordion and a bass violin were also introduced. Select hymns were sung from 1840 to 1843 when the church psalmist was substituted. All this old-time music was given place to a regularly organized choir of talented musicians. In 1852, church trustees voted to acquire six lots on 7th Street. That is now part of the current city block owned by the church today. The price was $600 for half of the block. Ground was broken April 16, 1859, and less than nine months later, on January 7, 1860, the third church building was dedicated. The cost of the new 400-seat church was $18,500. This church building served its members and community well for 108 years, taking the congregation through the Civil War, two severe depressions, World War I and II, Korea, and part of the Vietnam conflict. In the 1950s, the church undertook a new building project that included the construction of the new Christian education facility and an all-faith chapel, which were dedicated March 6, 1955. Just more than a decade later, First Congregation began construction on its fourth and current church house. It was dedicated in April of 1968. It certainly has one of the most impressive entrances of any church in town. As we leave the site of the Congregational Church on the left, we want to look uh, at what's on the right across the street from the church. This is the block where the uh, Portier Museum is today. And at one time, this block was called Court Square. And uh, we'll see the reason for that in a future video. We really can't get a very good look at what I want to show you, the area I want to show you because of the trees. So let's go up in my balloon and take a look from above. All right, we can see a little bit better now. You can see the Portier Museum there on the left. This whole block, though, at one time was a public park and was referred to as Court Square. There was a public school on the north side of Black River on Broad Street or now McMorrin, but there was no public school built on the south side of Black River, at least until 1842, when a school was built in uh, Court Square. It was built on the northwest corner of Court Square, represented by the yellow rectangle. The school on the north side of Black River was called the North Union School, and the one on the south side of Black River was called the South Union School. In 1859, the South Union School burned. It was immediately replaced by a building that was named the Washington School. This Washington School shouldn't be confused with the one that was later built on 10th Street. This was a large brick building, three stories high, with a square bell tower on the roof. I think this is the best picture we have of the school and also gives you a, a nice picture of what the park looked like, including the fountain. Even though the school was named Washington School, people had a hard time calling it that for a long time, at least I assume that, because 11 years after it was built in this uh, 1871 directory, it's still referred to as a South Branch Union School between 6th and 7th Court and Wall. I found this statement elsewhere in the same directory, uh, which is 1871, which is the oldest directory I have access to. And it says this, the South Branch is located on Court Square between 6th and 7th Wall and Court Street. This is the part that tickles me. This building is a brick, large size, but poorly calculated, and is getting somewhat old and out of style. 
What tickles me about this, a hundred years after the thing was built, it was still standing strong and being used when I was a young man. The school was for students of all ages. It could accommodate 400 students. And the high school was located on the third floor. Here are some class photos from this school. This one taken in 1905 of the first grade. Here's a picture of a teacher in her classroom with her students. The caption says that things flying above the students' heads are paper birds. And here, uh, we'll take a look at the complete caption. Maybe you'll recognize some of these names. I'm sure you do. I know I do. In the 1868-1869 school year, there were 64 students enrolled at Porcher High School. The senior class had four members. An admission fee of 25 cents was paid by anyone who wanted to attend the graduation. And this picture you're looking at now are the four graduates of the first Porcher in high school on 7th Street. And here we have the names, James Atkinson, Charles Stockwell, Alice Skinner, and William Boyce. After the new Washington School was built on 10th Street, uh, this building became the St. Clair County Bureau of Social Aid. But most of us, at least in my age group, would remember it as the Bob McBeady Youth Center. It was a place for teenagers to hang out in the evening, especially on the weekends, and I think they were open perhaps on Wednesday night. They had dancing on the first floor along with a soda bar and snack area. Of course, the music was supplied by a jukebox. On the second floor, they had a game room which included ping pong and a pool table as well. And they had a gymnasium on the third floor where they played basketball. Many people were saddened when this building was torn down in February of 1966. It was still straight and strong after 107 years. It had cost $20,000 to build. And it was our oldest school building in Port Huron at the time that was still standing. Thanks to a video clip that we have from the Ken Maxson family, we're able to see uh, when they were tearing it down. Here you can see the back of the library, or I guess the museum now. And here you can see that the third floor has already been demolished and is no longer there. First and second floor is all that's left. Well, that pretty well wraps up the 1100 block of 7th Street. Join me in my next video, and we'll see what else there is to see on 7th Street.